welcome and thank you for joining us today to discuss how to put people at the heart of sustainability. Before we begin the webinar, we'd like to do an acknowledgement of country. In the spirit of reconciliation, I acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. I pay respect to their elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. I'm Emma Webb and I'm part of the experience and engagement team at Mercer. I'm joined today by my colleague, May Lee, and special guests, Alex Edney and Angela Barton. We want to make today's webinar an interactive conversation and we will have time for some of your questions at the end of the session. So firstly, I'd like uh, to introduce our special guests. Alex Edney is Head of Culture and Diversity at World Vision Australia. He is the voice for World Vision's values and helps the organisation to put them into action. Alex has a really varied background um, across sectors and disciplines, but at the heart of his career is really um, that passion for making a difference. Welcome, Alex. Thanks, Emma. Great to, great to um, join you today. And Hi, everyone online. Um, yeah, World Vision is a Christian organisation that empowers Australians to create meaningful change for children through relief, development and advocacy work. So we're Australian, but we're also part of a global partnership of more than 100 offices around the world, which is dedicated to transforming the lives of children and communities uh, by tackling the causes of poverty. And you might have just seen our CEO, Daniel Wordsworth, in the media over the last few days as he's in Ukraine sharing stories where we're... Uh, from where we are responding to the unfolding humanitarian crisis there. Uh, but looking forward to sharing some of the stories of how we're putting people at the center of everything we do at World Vision. Fantastic, I can't wait to hear more. Thanks, Alex. Our second panelist today is Angela Barton. She's General Manager, People and Culture at Sixth Australia. In her role at Sixth, she's been leading the rebranding um, of Sixth from Thrifty and has been embarking on a significant organisational transformation. Welcome, Ant. Hi, Emma, thank you for having me. So like you said, Sixth um, came into being on 1 December last year. We're a German family owned business. Uh, there's 2,100 locations across the world, over 110 countries. We have 71 of those locations from our corporate network and 165 branches in Australia. So we've seen a huge transformation in the last 11 months since I've been working and it's a really exciting space to be in. Yeah, great. I can't wait to hear more about that. And finally, um, my colleague, May. Hi everyone, and thanks so much for joining um, post Easter and Anzac Day. I know it's a bit of a, a uh, kerfuffle getting the uh, schedules together, but certainly today's going to be an exciting opportunity to um, hear the stories from our wonderful guests, Angela and Alex. It's certainly very rewarding from my own perspective um, as the leader of engagement and culture experience team at Mercer to really see and hear the real lived experiences when it comes to um, what actually works, uh, as opposed to the theory and um, the information we often read. Also today is uh, culminating in an opportunity for us to share with you some hot off the press data from our very recently launched Global Talent Trends uh, report. Uh, the headed, headed with um, the rise of the relatable organisation I think the hint there is it's a very, very human centric way forward when it comes to understanding what's going to work currently, but also moving forward. It consists of 11,000 voices over 16 key geographies. And today isn't actually about sharing all the amazing data that's come through, but really giving you an illustration of how we can bring together the full story together in the context of um, the stories that Ange and Alex will share. Part of that is understanding that, as you know, rethinking priorities um, is really on the cards for just about everyone. I'm sure each of us on this call have had at least a moment thinking, do I ever need to work again? But here we are, we're working and actually it's on us to make our workplaces something more human centric and connective 
as possible with 82% of employees really feeling like their organisation will do the right thing for the society. It's really then on us as leaders of an organisation and as employers to really step up to that challenge. On the flip side, we also know that one in five employees will feel risk of burnout if they feel their values are misaligned to the organisation in which they're part of. So really does set the scene in terms of understanding um, where, where sustainability is and in terms of the good place to start. And whilst sustainability is a collective endeavour, um, the multifaceted nature in which you draw upon the different partnerships that are essential, starting with the purpose is very key. And we absolutely hear a lot about that um, in our webinar today. So in terms of understanding um, people's sustainability and, and the definition around that, uh, we do pose a, a definition um, in the next slide, but it's really just offering a bit of a starting point. But what we do know that actually the sustainability and what it looks like in each of our organisations is incredibly culture specific, very personal and tailored to um, the nuances of what we know are our own organisations. And so against a backdrop of an expectation from employees that we really should be pursuing a sustainability agenda, the challenge then is for each of us to understand how do we then define and unpack that. So Ange, if we were to think about people's sustainability and what that means, understanding that, you know, in different contexts, it can be very different. What is it for you in the sixth environment? We have a marketing tagline where we go above and beyond, and we like to translate that to our people as well. We realise that people are the core of our business. So we talk about going above and beyonding for our customers and our people. To give you a recent example, we, are a mobility provider. So COVID decimated our business. There were no international arrivals. There were border closures. So we ran the risk of having to let people go. What we did in the last set of lockdown in New South Wales was we redeployed some of our frontline staff into head office roles. We wanted to show them that we really valued them as people and we wanted to, them to stay with us in the business. I can speak firsthand of what a great project that was. One of my people consultants is an ex frontline so a customer service rep, and given that 70% 70, 70 of our people are frontline staff, it was really good to see the translation of their skills into head office. Um, absolutely fantastic initiative and one that really showed the people that we look out for them and we want them to stay. It's much better to grow people internally than have to constantly look for recruitment initiatives as well. Mm, amazing. I mean, the COVID environment really has, um, you know, if anything, the crisis has absolutely created a multitude of opportunities for people to come together and leaders specifically. And I've seen firsthand how that can generate in terms of positive um, outcomes, such as the ones you're sharing and heightened engagement and contain uh, retention as well. Um, Alex, um, World Vision is quite a, a, a different organisation in terms of um, an established brand and more familiar um, mission vision statement, um, you know, what does people's sustainability um, mean in your context? Yeah, thanks, May. Um, I mean, as I said before, we're a purpose driven organisation. And I think you know, that familiar brand, what people will know World Vision for is our passion for life in all its fullness for every child. That's the thing that drives us and paired with that is our prayer for every heart, the will to make it so. So we, you know, that's a people focused vision and it's natural then for us to have a people focus internally as well. So people sustainability means focusing more on our shared humanity, seeing people for who they are and not just resources. Um, but I mean, it's it's not as simple as just having a people focused mission. And over the last 18 months or so, we've had to reset how we look at that mission and how we bring it to life with our people. So that's some of the stories that I'll share as we go through our conversation today. Mm, it's, it's an interesting challenge, isn't it, when not-for-profits um, have this sort of inherent um, intrinsic motivator for, for its people, but I've certainly seen through our own work uh, the challenge in which to be 
um, more operational and competitive when it comes to um, understanding its people and the shifting expectations. Yeah, that's right. So that's really, I mean, that's really interesting. Thank you for sharing both. So, we, you know, we've already heard the definition um, of people sustainability can mean really different things depending on your organisation, um, where you are on your journey in the context um, with where you sort of sit. So we would like to take this opportunity to ask um, you all today, um, we're going to set up a bit of a poll now, just to get a bit of an understanding of what you're doing within your organisations. Um, so I'll give you a couple of minutes to do that. Um, Alex, where, what are you, what's World Vision focusing on? Yeah. Um... I really, I really love this question because it sort of has a um, an assumption built in that there is, you know, a real focus on people sustainability in organisations. And for us, really, uh, particularly in the last uh, probably six months now, uh, but our, our focus has been on the well-being of our people and uh, predominantly uh, mental uh, mental health and well-being. Mm, okay, and is that from you know from the has you have your employees been asking for that or is that something that you have just sort of I, I wouldn't necessarily say that it that they were asking for it I think it's uh, one of those things that's been uh, part of the the societal conversation in the last sort of four or five months as um, as we came through long lockdowns again in Sydney and Melbourne um, and we uh, you know that shared experience that we all had of of uh, coming into a summer uh, with with a built up of hope that mm -hmm. it was going to be different and it, um, you know, we gave all of our staff a well-being day in October uh, to give people a chance to reset towards the tail end of those lockdowns um, and we were we were sort of hoping that that summer was going to provide that um, recharge of the batteries for everyone and when when COVID sort of took off over summer and it really um, added a load to people uh, I think it, there was a, a common understanding when when we when we um, started to re-engage in work in January that uh, that you know many people were really feeling that that uh, mental load and it was out of that that we decided to um, to start up a, a more intentional initiative which has now been running for a couple of months that is um, really designed to to actively support people um, and and I guess create uh, a safe way for people to have a conversation around their their well-being yeah Great. And Ange, what about, what about you at Sixth? Uh, well, being a relatively new brand, we're really focused on the talent attraction and retention piece and tied into that our employee experience across the whole of the business. So we are currently moving a little bit more to social media to recruit. And one thing we are working on at the moment is what we're calling Six Talk. So we are doing TikTok videos. <laughs> Rightly or wrongly, the leadership team are about to produce a TikTok. So watch this space. I can't wait to see that. Yeah. <laughs> the creativity, um, all the, you know, the innovations have to sort of bring, you know, birth during this time. It's like, you know, all, all the old rules have been thrown out and anything can thrive in this environment. And um, certainly I'm, I'll be keen to see uh, examples of your leadership team doing your six top two. <laughs> <laughs> so if we can have a look at the results from the poll, what have we got? Uh, wow. So the, the, the predominantly people were saying all of the above. Fantastic. So, you know, obviously it's definitely on the agenda for, for, for most people on the call today. Um, what else have we, the, the second highest was around similar to, um, to you, Alex, in terms of that mental and emotional wellbeing um, and inclusion and diversity. That's a huge focus too, we've noticed. Um, Okay, it, fantastic. It also reflects what a big topic this is and incredibly challenging to narrow down. And we share with you a bit of a holistic framework which may help sort of identify how to perhaps prioritise. Um, but certainly, you know, in our conversations in leading up to this event, we've talked a lot about the joining the dots in terms of how much this can encompass and how different it can look um, depending on where anyone is at in terms of the maturity of this topic. Fantastic. Okay. 
So, I mean, our ultimate goal around this is to, to build high growth organizations. And you could argue that perhaps thriving is the new engagement. Um, I know engagement is still a very important um, metric for many. And I am, you know, I was born and bred, raised, um, you know, talking about engagement and certainly I continue to do so. But the, the opportunity within, with thriving is about that building a fulfilling, um, energizing and valuing environment where engagement actually doesn't quite hit the mark. So it's about combining those two th elements together and taking a more holistic approach. You see here on, on this um, slide, it, it's actually considered a multiplier and it really pulls together a number of different elements and some of which uh, we, we offered as options in the previous question. So thinking through all of these can actually get you closer to the mark for um, building sustain, sustainability in, from a cultural perspective. So if we were just to think about um, the, the previous question about holistic, um, if we just go back to the other slide, Emma, please. Um, you know, I would love to know that from six, you're at the beginning of the cultural journey and, you know, alignment to purpose and values we talked in the beginning was really that starting point. Um, but understanding you had to sensitively balance the values of um, NRMA with, um, you know, the head office of six, how did you work towards that alignment? I think it was a really interesting piece for us. Uh, the six values aligned to the NRMA values. So just to be clear, we are owned by the NRMA. So it was really important that we kept that alignment. We were working with a purpose-led organisation like Six. They have a really big space in electric vehicles, EV and sustainability, which is at the heart of what NRMA do as well. So that was a nice piece. But what we've done is we've taken what we have, which is a playbook, so our NRMA values, and we just ensure that we we refer to it as weaving a blue thread. So we are our own business. We are a younger business. So we like to have our ways make sure that we align back to six and we align back to the NRMA. So our team are very well aware of the NRMA playbook and the values aligned to that. And my thanks, which is our recognition program, all sits within that space. I think we had a relatively new leadership team as well. Our CEO has only been with, uh, about 15 months into the role. When I started, there were four other LT that commenced at the same time. So as a leadership team, it's been really important for us to get together, learn each other's strengths and how we work best together Together to ensure that our values flow through the organisation. Mm, that's really quite um, a, a common occurring theme around values, purpose, and then building in that leadership presence. Um, you know, moving brand, um, you know, would have been quite a challenge, particularly for those with long tenure. Uh, can you share with us some of the, the barriers you might have had in sort of unlocking um, you know, what a new future for those uh, longer tenured employees might have looked like? Sure. So in the first six months after I commenced, we obviously transitioned to a new brand. We sold our arm of the business in New Zealand and we acquired 43 new lo locations in southeast Queensland and northern New South Wales. So just a huge amount of change for everyone. And we were expecting our people to keep pace with us. So we have a very visionary CEO. And that's great, but we've also just got to remember that people are at the heart of what we do. So we need to ensure they come on the journey. So mm -hmm. one thing we did very early on was we were we engaged with an external company called Beam. And we looked at our vision and our strategy as a leadership team, and we ensured that that flowed through to our people. So we broke it up into little bite-sized chunks and we had each of our team leaders come back and look at our people vision. So what is your purpose? What's your team's purpose? And how does that fit into our strategy? It mm -hmm. could be anything as small as I come to work today to make sure a customer has a great experience. And then we fed those stories back up through the business. But it was important to us that everybody felt like they were part of our journey. Mm, really, really critical, that personal connection. Um, I, I would imagine, Alex, you might have had a, a similar journey to share whilst um, you hinted before that, um, you know, the not-for-profit environment whilst has its tremendous opportunities uh, in terms of uh, almost having you know fully fledged 
um, intrinsic motivators being available to people, um, it, it's not always a given, is it? Can you talk us through um, your journey, Alex? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that that's a, it sometimes makes it easy in the not-for-profit sector because our our purpose is so strong that it, it um, stops us thinking so hard about how we live that purpose. And, uh, and so for us at World Vision, that's been a, a big part of our conversation in the last um, 18 months or, or longer. Um, and I mentioned our, our CEO, Daniel Wordsworth, he joined the organisation at the beginning of last year. And when he over the first maybe three months after he started, he ran listening sessions with um, with nearly a quarter of the organisation in small groups. And in, in, in those, he asked just a couple of simple questions. Like, what do, what do I need to know coming in as the CEO? And what would you like me to do? Um, and uh, so, you know, put, put himself out there um, openly for people to share. And in those, he, he picked up on some stories that we were telling ourselves and while, while we were connected to our, our mission, working passionately and diligently to achieve it, there's those stories that we were telling ourselves were holding us back. Mm -hmm. So um, then over the next couple of months, he worked with, a, with an internal team of uh, some of our marketing team and um, communications team to write a, a book, which was called The Underground Forest. And it was using a, a land regeneration technique called farm and managed natural regeneration, which we believe is the key to unlocking climate change. Just I can talk about that another time. Um, uh, but you know, pioneered by World Vision Australia, and and we use that as a as a metaphor for our organisation. So this idea that there is an underground forest that just needs to be nurtured, and it will um, it'll form it, it can regenerate lands and form a forest on the surface. Um, and through that story, we introduced three guiding beliefs, which then shape how we bring our shared global values to life in Australia. Um, and you know, Ange, uh, we're not that dissimilar in that we're part of a global partnership of 100 offices around the world, but we are our own unique entity in Australia and with our own identity. And so how do you connect values shared globally with the way that we bring them to life in Australia? And the way that we've done that is, is through these three beliefs, which is that the world is abundant and that people are good and together we can make a difference um, and and in introducing those um, there was also the the intention through the story of sparking pride in who we are as an organization mm -hmm. so then over the next few months we de delivered another three sessions which were delivered first to senior leaders and then department by department all all led by the ceo so a huge investment of time which itself was symbolically powerful but in those directly addressed the the myths that were holding us back and then planted new stories um, really trying to build pride and ignite belief in who we are as an organization and um, and through those conversations um, we were able to reset the way that we saw ourselves, um, and we've seen an increase in engagement. I know you're saying, um, questioning perhaps whether engagement's the right metric, may, but um, uh, we've seen it grow by 13% from 2020 to 2022, and we already had reasonably, um, reasonably strong engagement, and we're now nearly at 80%. Um, and all of this is with without pulling any of the traditional levers that a CEO, a new CEO might pull. So we have the same strategy, we have the same structure, and um, other than uh, one kind of natural attrition, we have the same executive leadership team. Um, but through that, we've seen this transformation in the way that we see ourselves, the way that we present ourselves. It's so powerful that um, you hadn't, you, you didn't have to actually create any big structural changes to to energize or reposition um, the people uh, to be able to unlock new beliefs. I think that would be such a, a interesting case study on its own. Um, certainly, when we talk about culture building and helping organizations evolve, one of the key challenges is around how do we make culture stick? You know, how do we make those new beliefs actually overtake the others, the old ones, the ones, the assumptions that have been, you know, weaved into this, the skin of the people. So share with us, Alex, uh, what, what are some of the new systems and processes you might have had to introduce to help build out those new beliefs? Um, I would say we, we haven't done it with systems and processes. We've done it through 
through storytelling um, and through discipline of language. I think there's um, a change that we have made or a significant change which has helped bring it to life is, is the launch of a, a repositioning of our brand. Um, and again, if you've experienced World Vision in, um, in any of the kind of public domains in advertising or media, um, you, you might have seen our, our new sort of brand line, this means the world. And we're really focused on, um, on being able to bring or highlight the meaning that people can achieve through engagement with World Vision. Uh, you know, we see ourselves, and this is part of what was introduced through those sessions, is that we we see ourselves as enabling Australians to be their best self. Mm -hmm. That's that's what our job is. And so, um, coming, I guess, coming out of some of those is that we have had a, a bureaucracy busting initiative, um, and we've had some uh, some other projects and. But um, it's not, we haven't focused on using the system to address that change. Sounds like it's certainly very organic and working um, very much um, in line with the, the growth um, analogy and metaphor that you're, um, you're, you're building. Interestingly, both of your stories, whilst at different points um, have such commonality and such beauty around, um, you know, the, the things that are clearly driving the, the success that you've seen so far. Um, in the next slide, um, we, we can share with you a framework for those who are looking for perhaps a little bit more structure um, and maybe haven't been able to have those storytelling opportunities that have naturally come through. Um, if we think about culture building as the holistic exercise and leaders as the primary drivers in both of your examples that you shared the the inspire, inspiring ceo has in all cases been actually at the forefront of developing the the new connections and beliefs and certainly a more human-centered uh, leadership style is very much um, necessary moving forward so if we offer a bit of a framework um, for building people's sustainability for those organizations looking for structure, we borrow from um, Maslow's hierarchy when it comes to the different levels and um, focus areas, if you like. From the bottom, the employment foundation is, as you would imagine, are the, the needs around the job security, financials, and the things that can get in the way of thinking um, beyond um, some, you know, meeting your basic needs. So above that then is, but also actually before we leave that, the Employment Foundation is also now very much around the ability to design around flexibility and having the time and space to do the work in a manner that can actually give people um, space to feel they're contributing from a personal perspective. Um, then we're also seeing the levels relating to health and wealth and development. And this is where that total well-being can actually interplay in terms of adding value to the total employment relationship and having the ability to be actually a partner in being able to um, increase or decrease um, rewards and values depending on what they might need. And this could look like um, access to EAP, it could be um, extra days relating to well-being um, in exchange for annual leave, it could be um, variations on uh, superannuation and how that's carved up. So it, it can actually look very different, but and then the leadership and learning path pathways is about that seeing that future and potential. And as you can see, it's all wrapped up in this holistic view of essentially nurturing um, the person and understanding their, their own needs. And the organisations that are getting it right are really those who are anticipating what an employee needs before it's actually being asked or requested. So what we're sort of seeing is that, you know, what people want from work fundamentally hasn't changed it's more around how we engage with work so and as you've sort of already sort of begun sharing with us implementing something as significant as a rebranding 
um, as part of an organizational transformation and with new leadership or within a really short time frame can you give us some insight into you know how you've approached shifting some of the mindsets um, of the people and leaders yeah absolutely we um regularly talk to our staff, we test them, we do surveys, we ask questions. Um, as a newly formed leadership team, we're really interested in hearing from them. And we actually mean it when we say it. So we try it in all different fashions, I suppose. One thing we have noticed in our, we've, we do some Your Voice surveys and our engagement piece is 90% of our employees love their manager. And that is huge. So that really speaks to the level beneath us. Yeah. So what we've done is, worked really hard on our communications. And as I said, 70% of our staff are frontline people. So we can't make an assumption that communication via email hits the mark for them. Communication, how anyone in head office would read it is exactly the same as they would read. So we have taken that leadership level, the managers, and we work directly with them and we trial different things and we ask if it's working. So to give you an example, we have what we refer to as a six tub. So six tub for us is something that people can see on their phone. So car detailers, customer service reps can have a quick look. All of our communication sits on our six tub. Um, any emails with important notices, we make sure we use Yammer, we use Twitter. It all sits in one place. We do a monthly town hall, which we record. So people can go back and they can watch it at their leisure. And I think that has just helped the communication piece. So everyone across our business gets exactly the same messages in a format that suits them. Another initiative that we're about to roll out is a walk in your shoes program. So for us, it's people in head office getting out frontline, detailing cars, working behind the counter, understanding what the majority of our people do and the barriers they face every day. Because I don't think as a leadership team, we can make informed decisions about what a day looks like for them, unless mm -hmm. we're actually going out there and seeing what it is in real time. Yeah, fantastic. That's really, that's so interesting. And I really like the, you know, when you were talking about tailoring that communication, because that is really key to ensure that we are targeting everybody, you know, everyone's getting the same messages too. So great. Thanks, Ange. Um, Alex, obviously, as an organisation with a really strong legacy in humanitarian work, um, I'm interested in, in hearing your sort of version of, of how you sort of challenge those existing assumptions um, you know, when you're engaging in this sort of um, change? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I think as I, share, as I shared, you know, that, that process that uh, our CEO Daniel went through in listening, which unearthed some of those assumptions which were, um, which were holding us back from our potential. Um, in, in going through that process, what he was able to do was distill them down to quite um, quite specific stories that we were telling ourselves. So, um, for example, one of one of the myths was that the sector is in decline, uh, the giving sector. And you know, I think um, you know we we all carry some of these things that whether it's about our sector or about our organisation or about our country and our community, where we we have assumptions that may once have been true or may have never been true, but that we've picked up along the way and have just become part of the story that we tell. And yeah, you know, we like they're they're all emerge at, at this time when we're talking about um, election campaigns because people come out with very clear statements about what they believe to be true. But uh, yeah, yeah, we 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 pick those up along the way on our journeys and then we share them with others and then they just become part of the culture. And so there was um, those beliefs that existed within our organization. And like you say, as a long and well-established organization, those are tied to our sense of our identity and who we are. So um, through, through, through conversation and through discussion, um, Daniel tried uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a gracious and engaging way, bringing, bringing staff along on the journey, but he, he undid those beliefs. He undid the story, um, and he did it in a way that introduced um, introduced doubt, and then planted a new story. And it was quite skillful because what it did, rather than rather than standing up and saying, uh, "If you believe this, you're wrong," mm -hmm. he he brought everyone along with him, so that by the time he said, "This is not true," the general consensus was. Yes, it's not true. Why? Why did we think that? Or, or, um, or I can't believe we we thought that. Or held on to that to that for so long. Or that we'd never thought to 
to test those assumptions. Um, and uh, by, by doing that, he was then able to, I guess, unlock a sense of, of belief and a sense of um, potential or, or an embracing of the potential that we have you know, as, as the largest NGO um, in Australia. So it was, it was, a, it was, a, it was a very, I, I mean, I think it, that's the, the challenge every time when you come up against the, the from state that we want to move away from is how do you do that in a way that's non-judgmental, that doesn't, that doesn't leave everyone who holds on to that belief feeling like they are somehow wrong or they are somehow judged and so um, through through the storytelling approach he was able to to address that but that brought everyone along and built them up rather than um, rather than you know putting them offside and leaving them behind yeah and that that sounds really powerful you know and I think that that's probably why it was so successful I guess in terms of that storytelling fantastic thank you uh, as, as we can experience, it's such a big topic and I'm sure, you know, if time allowed, we would just keep talking and, and sharing. Um, but in terms of helping, and we've got some fabulous questions that have come through, so we do want to leave time for that. But if we were just to, um, you know, dive in to offer some get started type suggestions for people on the call, as well as perhaps some you know things that you might want to offer as accelerators for those perhaps a little bit further along on the journey um you know this is significantly really seen as a cultural shift it's a transformation uh, whether we say it's around um, people's sustainability or you know triggering uh, changes in beliefs it really is around considering the, the people and how do we drive people through all that we do. So from that perspective, Angela, what would you say are some of your key learnings that you I think could offer? the key learning that I've taken away is listen, be prepared to listen and refine. So let go of that notion that in six months time, it's going to look like this for our people mm -hmm. and just gather bits and pieces of information as you go. Be okay to shift your direction and be open with people to say, we're trialing and we're learning, we're hearing what you're saying. It might look completely different in a couple of months time, but that's okay. I know for my people and culture team, we meet with our regional managers. So they run the operations team across Australia. So we have a fortnightly catch up with them where we just have an open question. We're trialing this, is it working? If it isn't, tell us what we need to do to make it better for your people. And likewise, we do the same with head office staff. So for me, it's just about listening and being able to pivot. Mm -hmm. Don't want to put you on the spot, but do you have an example of where, you know, it sort of sounded good in theory? And Absolutely. Just, I could give you a hundred examples okay. of where it hasn't gone great. Um, mm -hmm. I think probably we did an initiative for International Women's Day this year. And as a leadership team, we agreed we would give every woman across our business two hours back in their day to do something nice for themselves and not focus on work so we thought it was the most amazing initiative ever we went out with it to our people leaders and I got an email back to say great initiative however we do our rosters two weeks in advance so it was purely a wording thing where all we needed to say was take two hours off at a time that suits you and do something nice for yourselves. But by saying on International Women's Day, you're going to take two hours off, we set off a flurry of activity across the business that we didn't mean to. So I think it's always that test and learn. Now the check in with the RMs to say, if we write it like this, what does it actually mean for you? Was a huge learning instead of the leadership team high fiving each other on our great initiative. <laughs> And it didn't really take a lot just to, you know, reposition that slightly and then everyone benefits. So exactly. I mean, that's that's a, a real exchange in trust and um, mutual respect around and we're, we're still the intent is there to to do good. Um, so I'm, I'm glad that was a, a good learning. Um, fabulous. Alex, um, to you, you must have like a swag of um, lessons you could share. What, what would you pick out? Um, maybe specifically, specifically around um, helping the next level down. I know that middle managers sometimes get a bit stuck. You know, you might have your inspiring CEO, but then the next level down, the messaging might get a bit lost. If I was to, you know, point you in that direction, do you have some lessons there? Yeah, I mean, I think um, 
you know, I've spoken about a CEO, um, Daniel, and, and the way that he's led um, this, the reset of how we've, we bring our mission to life. Um, and you know, it's true that we're fortunate to have a leader who has a personal commitment to people's sustainability and bringing people along on the journey. But, um, you know, so the first, my first sort of reflection is that it all starts with leadership. And so if you are a, if you are a leader um, or if you're in a position of influence, then, you know, it's being, being aware of um, the opportunity you have to shape the culture of the organization through those stories you share and the stories you allow others to share. Um, and, and I think, you know, if you're not in that position of leadership and you're looking to shape culture, then it's engaging with leaders and influencing and, to, and um, building their interest and engagement in, in people's sustainability. But to your point about how do you then engage the next layer, I mean, one of the steps that we took um, for every conversation that that Daniel shared with the whole business. He shared it first with his executive leadership team, and then he shared it next with our senior leadership group, which is all of our reports to executive leaders. Um, and so it, there was a, about four weeks for those conversations to, um, to take place and permeate before he then shared uh, these, uh, I guess this challenge and resetting of stories with the business. And the intent was to really give people an opportunity to engage. We actually had, those sessions were longer with more time for conversation and discussion um, where Daniel was able to engage directly with, uh, with those senior leaders in a way that helped, helped all of us to better understand and refine the points that he was seeking to make. Um, and then my, my other point, um, the other lesson that I would share He's really, and I think you mentioned it when you're talking about people's sustainability and nurture the person. You know, I think the lesson is to focus on developing people, not on developing employees. Um, you know, we have, a, we have a fantastic talent team that um, have, have put in place a bunch of initiatives which are really about helping people to be their best self. And what we trust is that They'll bring, they'll bring that best self to work and we'll get a dividend of that over time. And then when they move on from World Vision, they'll take that legacy or into their next role within World Vision, they'll take that legacy with them um, rather than trying to develop the employee and their skills within their current role. So really thinking about um, that humanity that we put at the center that drives us. Mm, absolutely. Lots of lessons there. Um, I think we have more opportunity to keep sharing. Um, perhaps we'll go to some of the questions. Um, Emma, did you have a favourite you wanted to pick from? I, I see we've got a few there. Yeah, we've got some really good questions here. Um, I think maybe um, if we go for this uh, one um, here from Joe, um, who do you believe needs to be the initial driver of people's sustainability? Um, and there's a sort of a, a second part to this question uh, as well. So I understand that all of leadership needs to be accountable, but in your experiences, who are the teams that generally instigate this change and how do you get everyone on board? Great question. I'm going to look at you, Ange, to start us <laughs> off. <laughs> Thanks, May. Um, yeah, that's a really interesting question. I believe everything needs to come from your CEO. So unless they are doing everything that they can around people's sustainability, you're going to have an issue. Um, we are lucky, we have a young CEO who's very engaged with our people and that helps to drive everything that we do. But I do also think that as a PNC leader, there's a lot of, um, it sits with me as well, because I need to be that person that's checking in doing the pulse checks to make sure I can feed up to the CEO messages that they may not be comfortable giving him themselves. And similarly with each people leader, they need to ensure that they know their people as real people and not just a commodity that we trade at work. So I really think it's important as a people leader to be across as much as people wanna share with you, what they look like, what their day looks like outside of the workplace as well, who their family are, what drives them to know all of those sorts of things and care about people for people. So I think that's the real value in it, but it definitely needs to be led by the CEO and the leadership team. And it's okay to have that debate in a closed room about what's working and not working, but you need to have a united front when you go out to your people. Alex, what's your perspective? 
Yeah, I, I, I agree with Ange that I think it really starts with the CEO. Um, although I would I would say that um, you know we're all human and we all have influence and we all have opportunity to um, to shape culture in our organization. Mm -hmm. And so uh, you know the CEO is as human as you and I and is as human as the frontline person. So um, with that, you know if if uh, if you're in an organization where it's not on your CEO's agenda, um, the the pe the people and culture team or HR team um, can take ownership and as long as they can create a business case that uh, and the CEO is prepared to support that with their words and actions, then um, a, a people and culture team can uh, can have a big influence on people and sustainability, uh, people sustainability. But uh, I mean, I think um, yeah, one of the one of the one of the challenges when you get a CEO who's really engaged in people is that you know you've got a HR team who's used to setting the direction around people, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden it comes responding to direction, and that there's a there's an adjustment process there which takes a little bit of time, but um, you know it's it it is. Uh, um, it really allows a HR team to live up to their potential. I think when you have a CEO who's engaged um, and who's who has a personal commitment to people's sustainability, but um, I, I don't think not having it should hold anyone back from trying to trying to pursue people's sustainability as something that's important to get on the agenda. It just means that it's uh, it's an influence game over time rather than necessarily you know uh, um, uh, being you know empowered to go from the start. I think that's a really uh, great perspective. It is about then influence and perhaps the reality is if you don't have a CEO who's totally focused on the people's sustainability agenda yet, um, then potentially it could be an influence that comes from the board. Uh, certainly they've usually got their eye on the, the necessary metrics, uh, the compliance uh, standards, and we're certainly seeing sustainability as very much that collective need to uphold the appropriate standards. And people sustainability is very much falling within the realms of um, measuring up, you know, the fair pay, um, gender equity, um, fair pay, uh, fair work practices. So certainly there's a lot of metrics currently floating around and that will be developed over time that will make it incredibly hard for the CEO or leadership team to continue um, not doing enough about it. I'm, I'm conscious that we've got um, some really good questions. So we want to try and get through as many as we can. If, we, if you don't get through them, we will um, send them via, you know, we'll get responses via email as well to send around. So um, a really good question here. How would you measure success on this change in focus and direction? Same again, you, Ange, and Mitchell. then Ange. <laughs> uh, so I would measure success or one measurement for me is around retention and engagement of our staff. So I really do think engagement and people's sustainability go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. So like I said, we do lots of your voice surveys. We've got another one in May where we'll be looking at that engagement generally sit around 75% engagement. So we'd like to see an uplift in that. But it's also about the growth of our people across our business. So telling those stories about people that might start in, you know, move to all sorts of different roles. We have one person on our leadership team that started 20 years ago as a retail sales officer. She now heads up operations for Australia. So we like to showcase those stories as well. Um, so I think that for us, that engagement piece and the retention piece are what I will be looking at over the next six months to see how well we're doing. Yeah, um, and I think we're, we're similar in um, in that we look at engagement as a as a, an indicator of um, of our people sustainability. Um, I, I think you know one of the one of the challenges as a purpose driven organisation is that um, there there's. We, we attract people that have a strong personal commitment to the, mm. the cause that we work in. Um, and then, you know, there's a, uh, it can, it can be, a, I guess, a bit of a lead, can lead to people um, lacking some of those traditional work life boundaries and, mm. uh, and lead to a risk of kind of burnout over time. Um, so, you know, as an organization, we try to have some guardrails in to support people into in in maintaining their uh, in, in more active work-life balance but that is part of what we see as a contributor to um, to turnover um, the I think the other thing which is I guess less of a direct measure of people's sustainability but is 
um, is valuable to consider is how you're tracking performance wise as a business. You know, we, we perform because of our people. Um, we see that um, you know, it's a direct, it's a direct correlation, I think, between the, um, between our, our people and their engagement and our, and the, the focus on sustainability with our people and the performance of us as a business. So, um, you know, we, we, I guess we have, a, there's a little bit of a, a vibe of the thing going on where, you know, there's a sense of pride in, uh, that's emerging in the work that we're doing, but then we're also seeing it backed up with some of those figures like engagement and, and business performance as well. Mm. I've also seen what works well is when you combine engagement with um, broader metrics around well-being, um, safety and diversity and inclusion. So we, we're getting better at using engagement to help lead um, information and inform on what else it might mean creating a, a bigger picture. So um, I, th I think, you know, engagement stays. <laughs> it, it remains yeah. useful. Yeah, for sure. OK, we're going to go to the next question. This one's for you, Alex. Um, you spoke about engagement being brought to life through brand. I'd love to hear more about the connection points with marketing and how this collaboration with PNC delivered that impact. Yeah, so um, uh, I guess we have a perspective that um, your your brand is the, your 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 brand is the result of your customer experience, which is the expression of your culture, and so there is a direct connection between. Um, your employee experience and culture and your customer experience and therefore brand. And part of what we're seeking to do, um, what one of the initiatives that we're going to be launching soon is engaging the whole organization in a further series of conversations, CEO-led conversations, where we are um, seeking to mature the understanding of brand as more than a market-facing platform, but instead as, a, as something that we all um, have influence over and are responsible for, but in terms of a collaboration between um, between PNC and marketing, um, I think we, there's still, I guess, a fairly traditional method of engagement between uh, our marketing team and much of the rest of the organisation. Um, but uh, we're a very relational business, so then the, you know, in, internally, I think that's partly because of our human focus uh, and the type of people that we attract to work in a purpose-driven organisation, but um, those, those relationships often lead to uh, engagement between different teams and um, so you know, my role in, in people and culture and our um, head of internal comms actually sits within marketing, so there is this kind of uh, and we we have a we have weekly meetings together with our change manager where we kind of work as a as a team that's a cro that's cross functional. So we have these engagement points where um, there's more sort of relational collaboration, and then we have sort of the structured engagement between teams where we where we almost go as a customer to marketing and get their support on on initiatives. Mm, great. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. I'm. I'm trying to get through as many of these questions. We've got some really awesome questions. Thanks everybody. Um, the next one uh, was what ideas do you have on how to communicate the people sustainability message in an EVP? Uh, so I guess for us, it's quite subtle. We talk about people um, in our job advertisements, people being at the core of our business. We do it on our position description. So we've started out quite basically. I guess the other thing that we also do is it's in our strategy. So for us, our mission statement is to go above, to go above and beyond for our customers and our people. So it's front of mind internally and then when we go out externally to recruit. But like I said, we are relatively new. So we're just trialling different things, but that seems to work for us at the moment. Great. Thanks. Yeah, and I think I think we have a similar um, a similar approach in including um, in in trying to express our um, the way that we value people in in our um, in our job ads. Our, our talent team have just rebuilt our external facing careers website in a way that really uh, I guess positions um, our employee value proposition as human centered, and um, uh, and then um, you know we. It's also work that we're seeking to continue to do. And one of the things that we're working on at the moment, we're talking just about marketing people and culture engagement before, is um, is taking more ownership in our people and culture team of our LinkedIn 
profile so that we're then able to position uh, rather than rather than our LinkedIn being uh, a platform to market our brand as a platform to market our employee value proposition and really position our employer brand in the market. Um, so that's you know future work, but um, yeah, I guess all work in progress. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. And I think this probably leads um, nicely into the next question that we've got um, regarding attraction and attention. How do you create an employee benefits program that promotes this? What types of benefits are seen as important to both business and employee? So I think one I can talk to is last year with lockdowns, we with the NRMA gave everyone access to 28 by Sam Wood. So recipes online, classes that people could do access to something holistic a well-being piece but on the flip side we've recently done an initiative around incentives so for us it's a sales driver as well so it benefits both the commercial aspect of our business but also our people so it's the upset people come to the counter we've had first full month of it and our top salesperson earned double their salary for the month wow. so yeah just trialing different initiatives like that where we're going to benefit but our people are definitely going to benefit from something like that as well yeah and, and again i think tri trialing different initiatives is similar to what we're doing as well um, we've recently had a focus on trying to um, bring you know, and as as an as an existing business, you know, with a long long time presence in the market, um, we've had this sort of disparate collection of employee benefits that has sort of some of them. If you knew about them, you could access them, and um, but not everyone knew about them. And so, um, to, last year, one of our projects was just simply to be able to bring them together into a place that was able to highlight to people what the what the benefits were of uh, of working for World Vision and. Um, and being able to celebrate them. And then we've then been doing small things to try and add to that. Um, and, you know, again, still more work for us to do, but, you know, even as simply as, um, uh, as running a photo shoot day so that everyone could get a professional headshot um, for, we, we, we obviously now it's normal to, uh, we work in a blended model at World Vision, like I'm sure many of the people here do as well. Um, and so, you know, we've got Microsoft Teams, everyone's just got their letters on on uh, there because they haven't updated a, a headshot. So, um, providing professional photography to be able to get qual high quality headshots for people. It's just simple little things that are, um, I guess, are able to create a unique employee experience or um, just those little moments of, um, of something that's different and special. Awesome. It is reflective of um, the culture and where you're at, isn't it? Like each of your examples are purely reflective of uh, this is where we're at and this is what we need. And that that really just sums up um, people's sustainability and how that's so culture specific um, so beautifully. Um, I apologize to everyone whose questions we didn't get to. We got some really awesome questions. So we will send out a little um, a sheet for you, but we do need to wrap up um, now. We've got two minutes, May. Okay. Um, so if you haven't got it by now, we're absolutely all about experience and people sustainability is absolutely here to stay moving from where we were in terms of that transactional loyalty exchange is certainly um, something that we're, we're trying to leave behind um, and moving very much through to one a, and then a contract or a relationship that's very much human led and human centered all about the relationship and understanding that whole person. Um, this is taken from our recently launched uh, Global Talent Trends Report. Um, there is far more behind this, but I'd like to share it with you as by way of summary, just to reinforce the human-centered nature in which our discussions that we've had today are uh, all about um, ensuring total well-being, um, not just the focus on healthy, but healthy outcomes um, whilst we're working and um, being aligned in an organisation. So really grateful and thank you so much, um, Ange, Alex and Emma for um, the conversation today. Great, thank you. Thanks so much.